Hello everyone, this is YC. So today I want to share with you the workshop that we had attended during the um, British and Irish chapter um, ISMRM meeting on the 7th of uh, September this year in 2022. So British and Irish chapter has this like MRI conference and basically the um, main point of the conference, the whole theme is about translating imaging fixes to the bedside. So um, the, during the first day of the conference, we have a panel discussion which the committee bring about different professionals from um, radiographers, radiologists, all the way to clinical scientists, and we also have uh, open science agencies. So I think as a researcher myself, uh, I can really easily be part of uh, more than one of these spaces at these different organizations. So uh, I thought that I will make this summary and um, share with everybody sort of what I had learned during the conferences uh, workshop section. So hopefully with this summarized opinion pieces, um, people, uh, the, the audience will be able to bring back home and think about what kind of these aspects and what kind of these like, communication uh, strategies is important and that you think um, do you, when you're in the future, you will want to participate in specifically this area. Um, how would how would these um, these opinion pieces sort of like affect your day-to-day -day work. Yeah, so hopefully um, by the end of this uh, presentation, you will understand the challenges faced by people at these um, different sides of the table and uh, support the communication with each other as a wider MRI community much, much easier. So first of all, So first of all, from a radiologist's point of view, um, the radi radiologist attended the conference, which uh, Dr. Shoni Puani from King's College London, he mentioned that um, com the day-to-day -day communication difficulties a radiologist face is that they find it is hard uh, to give definitive answers to surgeons about whether to operate on the specific lesion that is found in the images. Another thing that they struggle with is that um, oftentimes radiologists know there are better tools out there because, for example, some companies will um, sort of pitch the, these um, new technologies to uh, radiologists, but then um, they know that these tools, the radiologists know that they can't use those tools because it's not approved, um, go through some specific approval um, procedures. So. Um, he did mention that, so in, in terms of having a successful translation of the technologies from um, a lab to the clini clinics, there are a few R's needs to be considered. First of all, motivation needs to be justified by the need. That means um, a, the, the development of a new um, imaging acquisition technique or a um, new compress, compress sensing technique needs to be um, motivated based on need. Um, instead of motiva motivated by motivation, basically. And the next thing is about resources. It needs to be as simple and less time consuming as possible. So I personally had also read through some of the um, opinion pieces that is published by um, the wider MRI community. So there are two things that I found had been mostly talked about by people um, and also by uh, key opinion leader mostly. So th the first thing is about um, a specific technology that had helped reduce the time that is needed to scan a same set of uh, images. Um, so that's that's um, accelerating factors or um, any sort of technique that allow, allow people to sort of um, reconstruct um, many different sets of images in one go. So that's one thing that is highly, highly applauded by um, the medical communities. And then the next thing is about uh, some specific imaging technologies that is helped, that had been showing proven help to reduce the need of uh, contrast agents because that saves money, saves a lot of time, saves resources to need to um, inject contrast agent or provide contrast agents for, um, for patients. So those are the two two main things that's like pretty much being um, widely, widely appreciated by clinicians or by radiologists or by clinical professionals. Um, and then the next thing he mentioned about is that regulatory approval needs to be done and that this one we will mention a little bit more during the um, next section. 
Um, next thing is repeatability and reproducibility for a specific technology needs to be conducted. We will also mention it together with the country research organization section. Um, next thing is about risk to patient needs to be considered, and this is um, needless to say. So what we need to think about is that oftentimes we have um, conducted research on healthy volunteers. So it is important for us to sort of prior to conducting the research consider, okay, if we have a diseased population, how would it be like um, if we were to uh, translate our technology into clinic? So um, the next thing is about relative performance. Um, these will be um, mostly done by systematic literature review if there are publications available or if there's no publications available, it will be likely to work out an agreement between different um, research centers and try to do testing um, across different sites. And then the next thing is about uh, considering the real cost. So he also mentioned about, like from his, his approach, he had seen that there are two different ways of uh, ensuring clinical translation. So you can either uh, work on a specific aspect of the complete pipeline and pass it on to uh, someone else who specializes in, in other uh, sections of the full adoption cycle. Or you can sort of go along um, the whole process from research to clinical adoption. And, but then with these use, you um, have to keep in mind that the time, average, average time for idea to come to fruition would likely be years and years, like sometimes decades of work. And so he mentioned about for Shimoli, a uh, shortened Moli sequence um, had been, had been um, going over all the way from 13 years um, from idea all the way to uh, consumer product, which is C2B, C2P um, classification, which is not necessarily a product we will talk about a little bit later. And for verdict, for verdict MR mapping, for instance, it takes about 10 years. Um, and that is widely used in um, prostate imaging for now. Okay. So for the next next speaker is the lead radiographer at OCMR here in Oxford. This is Rebecca Mill. Uh, so she mentioned about oftentimes in the daily operations um, for radiographers, um, what would be really helpful is to have a validation method that comes right on the spot to allow these radiographers to know that, okay, whether they will need to repeat the acquisition or not. So there are a few good examples. For example, uh, the Shimoli sequence um, has a R2 map. And so you will be able to use this R square, R square map to see, okay, like, so this, for, for example, if R square map is, is um, Smash Dark is less trustworthy. They might need to re reacquire, reacquire the um, T1 sequence again. And another good example is the uh, Stephen snap mapping with 95% uh, confidence, uh, confidence masking on the uh, MR elastography maps. So these tools allow daily operations to be pretty much having a sanity check. Um, bef uh, percentage check on each point um, of acquisition. So radiographers will really, really appreciate that. And sometimes radiographers also find themselves being in, uh, during being in the communication between phys physics, uh, uh, physicists and clinicians. So um, being, being in, in bridge between the communication wouldn't necessarily be such an easy job. So um, Oftentimes, um, um, radiographers, radiographers will appreciate if um, the technology um, developer can try to gain some feedback from the radi radiographers, it will be highly, highly appreciated. So, yeah, that's from radiographer's point of view. And then the next one is uh, clinical physicists. So we have Matt and Maria uh, during the workshop that had given us a few sort of um, challenges and what they found being work, worked well um, during the panel discussion. So first of all, staffing is a problem. So um, it will be helpful if um, each clinical site will have a dedicated computational team 
um, to help them run the analysis, run the training, and run the testing um, to sort of support uh, staffing, support resources and needs to support delivery. And then um, the, the other thing that the physicists also found is that oftentimes the hardware installation sometimes fall onto um, physicists' responsibility. Of course, when engineers come by, they will do um, the installation, but um, at a higher management team within a clinical, sec clinical setting, um, physicists are usually the point of contact to be responsible for hardware installation specifically. And then they also find themselves needing to understand regulations. And in this case, for the MR field in general, we will consider them as a um, medical device regulation. So, and it is by their experience, they found that it's not very straightforward. There is usually not one way to go through um, to apply to all medical device um, approval. So. Um, they suggested that if you were to go through to understand about um, medical device regulations, it would be better to just talk to people who had did it, um, who had done it, and um, try to work through it itself. And the communication difficulties that a, ph a clinical physicist face um, is usually where when they find many contradicting publications in the literature, um, in the publication space, and they want to keep this, keep keep a specific technology going to be tested in in the uh, clinic if there is contradicting result it's kind of difficult to push for for um, that technology to be continuous tested so and this is kind of like a dilemma because if things does not get tested it wouldn't get improved so yeah this is the communication difficulty And then the next thing, um, the next person on the table are the vendors. So um, unfortunately, this time during the workshop, we only had uh, um, Siemens, Siemens representative and Philips, Philips representative. And GE, there's no representative for GE attending the workshop. There are some other small vendors which not were not um, specifically like the big names attending the workshop. But um, yeah, at, at this point, we, we had um, Siemens represent, representative to give out their, um, their information. So interestingly, um, you will find the, the, the I, I, would, I would say from this point, you'll find the following parties talks less about the concern and less about the complaints, less about the difficulties. But then um, they will want to share sort of how the rate, how the processes, pipeline, the regulation part of um, aspect comes into um, clinical adoption. So um, um, Fabrizio specifically mentioned about that how vendors are, you, are actually quite happy and want to try to find collaboration opportunities. So usually they will have this like, um, scientific research initiative and to sort of work with work with um, academics to um, work out a technology's um, um, continuous development. So he mentioned that there are three stages of, of adoption um, and before all of these classification there were two like widely categorized two phases. Um, the first, first of all, it will be di uh, dissemination about the technology, and this will basically involved with what the motivation of starting off a specific um, study or clinical trial um, for developing a acquisition um, sequence or technique or um, I don't know, I don't know, a, a, a artifact reduction um, technique, something like that. Um, and then intellectual property discussion obviously is a very important point. They did mention about um, that's that's an important point. Um, and then so um, uh, the the next thing is that when these um, discussion and these type of steps are completed, they were started off uh, with the uh, classification um, for a specific technology. So C2P is the consumer to product uh, classification. And during this time, 
during this time, the academic institution will be the lead. And the um, prototype is created by the academic institute, and the prototype will be tested locally at the um, will be tested locally at the uh, academic institute, and the progress of performance will be shared with other predetermined clinical research facilities. So yeah, that's C two P. And then the next one is WIP, which is they called work in progress in Siemens' term. So at this stage, a prototype of the technology will be redefined by the vendor um, based on the lens lesson that they had learned, the experience that they had acquired during the distribution of the previous C2P prototype, which is the yeah previous section. And this time, the industry will be the lead for the work in progress. And it is also treated as a product, as a very early stage of a product, and will be registered somewhere, um, and some relevant documentation will be maintained, just like a product, and there will be active feedback collection. And then the last thing will be a product. So that that's at a stage where uh, vendors will compare a bunch of whips, a, lot, a bunch of work in progress, and plan out a release cycle of each of these selected product. And um, this is where regulatory assessment comes into place, and getting the clearance from FDA, CE, and Japan PDMA will be um, the main goal of releasing these products. And obviously, there will be release cycle every year or every half a year for those products. So yeah, that's from vendors' point of view. So basically, understanding how how these different sections is, I think, will be helpful for us if we were to support um, having a technology being translated um, into clinic. So the next one we will have um, individuals who worked at a open science and national physics laboratory. So I personally did not really get a lot out of their presentation, apart from knowing that being open and being standardized is what they had always been talking about. But I I didn't find any like practical, you know, practical, um, practical experience or practical lessons that they had give, given out, but. But uh, um, I will still mention about their opinions, which is regardless still very, very important. So Michael Tripleton had said that like sharing a testing pipeline will be very helpful to ensure a smoother translation. And he mentioned about that um, this one uh, tool called GitHub Workflow, uh, which I had tried to understand a little bit through the video included um, about GitHub Action is that this tool this tool will allow you to perform continuous integration and continuous deployment and um, therefore saves a lot of time before you manually transfer in a data set or a, a raw input or code um, from one place to another. So this help uh, with performance testing. And then Matt Hall, he worked at the National Physics Laboratory and I believe the message that he, the main message he's trying to convey to the audience is that rather than <coughs> rather than perfecting the measurements, um, we as MR researchers can try to design systems that will allow room for error, and therefore support more native clinical translation from MR physics to the bedside. So this is his main point. And then next on. Okay, so in this slide, I will bring over what I think the two entities that are actually fundamentally uh, different, but plays a very similar role in the space of the MR development and MR adoption in a clinic. So one is called the imaging network, and <coughs> and there are actually a lot of imaging network in the UK. So and CETA, uh, UK Renal Image Network, you also have Alzheimer's disease uh, research imaging network in which um, I believe that um, I, I hope um, the, the NCTA space, specifically working on cancer, I'm hoping to do some more understanding on, on, on their works um, during my um, time here as a doctoral student. And then the next one is called the Country Research Organization, which is called CRO. 
and during the workshop, um, the CRO that is attended the workshop was um, John Waterton, and he's from a CRO that is based in Manchester. So, um, um, so a CRO is a country research organization, but it is um, it's an entity that is contracted by uh, pharmaceutical companies or some other big companies to do uh, the heavy lifting of running multi-center trials. So there are many different CRO out there. Actually, you can also have drug country research organization, but the one we're talking here is specifically about the imaging CRO. So in the academic institute, um, usually, Usually we will have the privilege to test out all sorts of different methods and sparkle innovation, innovative ideas and talking to peers about the problems. And this is, <coughs> this is the research. And this is naturally bound as a time bound manner, manner and without very careful, but not without like very careful documentation. So these ideas will potentially be left out if like uh, the person going over to um, go and move on to their career uh, progression outside of academia. However, so um, as the uh, imaging CR representative pointed out that usually a sponsor, like the big pharmaceutical company, what they really want, what they really need is a fit for purpose biomarkers and they want the risk to be minimized and they want to know whether a technology had proven delivery. So there's actually a huge gap in between these two entities. <coughs> and so both of this institute will likely be collaborating based on different trials, um, clinical trials, and it can be single center trial or multi center trials. And um, depends on the nature of the phases of the trial, the timeline may vary drastically. And sometimes it's really difficult um, to be on top of this variable timeline and um, knowing when or where to track where stuff had been done and um, and, and where uh, specific I don't know documentation is is um, stored or maintained. So a CRO or an imaging network um, is is specifically designed to support these uh, challenging tasks. So timelines um, will vary. Um, so each of these organizations will ha likely have a specialized team focusing on different projects, on different phases of the trial. And standardization will be, will be conducted uh, as needed. And if there's any innovation that is needed, they'll be communicating in between these different, different um, entities. And so a quality management system and repeatability and reproducibility will be obviously properly documented during, um, during um, within these organizations and, and they can do sing, single center testing or multi-center testing. And um, another thing that is good about having these organizations specifically created to, main, to tackle these tasks is that they can also tackle um, malicious data linking. So it's about um, confidentiality, really. OK, so that is about image network and uh, CROs. So yeah, in, so that is um, everything we had talked about during the panel discussion um, from the workshop of British and Irish chapter. Um, I hope you find this really helpful.